Welcome to Backstage Pass with your host, David Nairn. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Backstage Pass. We've got another fantastic special guest with us here today. One of your favorite, favorite actors, brilliant comic, wonderful dramatic actor, gorgeous singing voice, the irrepressible Stephen Sparks. Sparky, how are you today? I am great. Good to see you. All is well in my world. Things Good. be different. I know. You're staying, you're staying happy. You're staying safe sound or somewhat sound are you and somewhat <laughs> but that's the somewhat's always been a given Stephen, audiences uh most recently i guess little women uh which was uh, such a fantastic show you were here with off the grid we'll talk about that experience specifically uh screwball comedy one of my favorite uh shows snow white christmas and i think sparky uh, in my 21 years here, probably, you know, one of those three most um, powerful, wonderful, just brilliant, brilliant pieces of theater, uh, Norman Bray. And, um, and you, were, you were a big part of that. Um, have I missed anything? I think, is that, I think those are all the ones that you've done with us. Yes, I think that's, we, I think you enumerated them all. And I totally agree, Norman Bray was a special uh, production from every department, from everybody delivered, yourself included, just fantastic work. And that piece holds a special place in my memory. I, the, apart from the fact that the set was all made out of corrugated cardboard, which I thought was really brilliant. I mean, you know, we've, and, and of course you've, you've done a, a ton of workshops for us and, and developing new work. And I, you do a lot of new work. Uh, I know you're doing a lot of developmental stuff. How did you find that process of working um, with a novelist and translating that to the stage. How, how was that experience for you as an actor? Did it, was it any different than what it normally is or was it, a, was it something that was unique? Oh, it's always really interesting. Uh, a lot of things about that experience were very interesting. First time playwright, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the room, which is always really interesting and off the grid and... Uh, and, and Norman Bray and a few other things I've done, to have the writer in the room, to watch them cringe <laughs> and to watch them laugh or to uh, watch them uh, in the middle of a scene, like grab a pen and write something down and, and then find out what, what's tweaking them. Because with Norman Bray, not, not a ton, uh, but with a few other things I've done, there's been quite an evolution of the play in the short rehearsal period. And it's, and it's really gratifying as an actor to help that voice coalesce and come together and, and blossom, I guess. Yeah, I think it, uh, that whole cast, I mean, I think you guys were so supportive of what Trevor Cole, the, the, the playwright, uh, novelist and playwright, that, what that process was that we didn't actually scare him away. He's working on another play right now. So the, the, experience, didn't, uh, the experience didn't scar him too terribly much. I'm glad to hear it. Um, it was really neat watching him. I remember there was one, I can't remember the word. I think I was uh, conflating house and home as I was learning the lines and getting off book, that tr tricky period where you almost off book. But I kept saying house instead of home or vice versa. And, and he said, do you want to change it? I said, no, your words are always better than mine. I will get that seated in. I know, I think that was probably one of those moments when I should have, you know, because we always have to, I always, um, we, there's, there's times when the playwright can be in the room when we're rehearsing and there's times when the playwright should not be in the room when we're rehearsing. And it's, it's always usually around, you know, the learning of the lines or trying to get the text right. You know, I've had playwrights say to me, am I ever going to see the play I wrote? <laughs> and 99 times out of 100 go, of course you will on those rare occasions. And Norman Bray was not one of them. You go, no, I'm not too sure. But you know, that process is always, is always something special. Yeah, and uh, most of the time, uh, I live with a writer. My wife is a, is a writer. And it's hard for me to learn my lines with her helping. Because the way my mind works, I don't have a photographic memory or anything. I, I get the idea and I, and I hone in on the actual words. But if I'm in the midst of learning and she's helping me, she'll, she'll, if I paraphrase at all, she jumps on me and said, 
Somebody sat in front of their computer and decided it was house, not home. They thought about that. So you need to respect the work that they put into it. I know, I'm just getting closer. And Sparky, forgive me, of course, one of your finest moments with us I th was the gentleman clothier. Oh, of course, you didn't say that one. Yeah, another... another I, I, you're Mr. Theater Orangeville. You work here more than I do. <laughs> I've been very lucky to be invited back so many times. And I, and I do consider the Theater Orangeville crowd family. It's, uh, I've had some of my best theater experiences there and made lifelong friends. Sparky, everybody always asks me, I guess when I'm acting or whatever, uh, we're trying to act, trying to keep up with the likes of you. Um, the weird and wacky stuff that's happened to you on stage. Everybody always kind of wants to know those, those neat little kind of things. So is, is there anything that jumps to mind, particularly where you kind of go, wow, that was a close one or <laughs> <laughs> made it through that? Uh, anything like that? that? Sorry, the joy of live theater. Yes, sometimes things go awry. Uh, oh, there's one <clears throat> way back early in my career at Stage West Dinner Theater in Calgary. Uh, we did a production of The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. And I played uh, a couple of roles, one of which was one of the football players. There's a scene where the, the boys have just won the, foot, the big football game and they come running in off the field into the locker room and in their football out, uh, gear and sing a song about how they won and how it's going to be a great night. And uh, uh, I put on my football padding and helmet and I thought, wouldn't it be neat if I did a handspring on the way? So I said, can I do it? So I ran up to the rehearsal hall and I did a handspring in my gear and I went, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I know better now. I was a young actor then. You don't throw those things in ad hoc. So I'm in the wings, ready for our cue. I turned to the guy behind me and I said, watch this. <laughs> and so I come running off stage, a little, on stage a little faster than I should. And I did a handspring. And of course, in the excitement, I over-rotated. So now I'm flying across the stage, panic, trying to catch up with my body. I'm wearing football gear. So I go, oh, there's the edge of the stage, the proscenium wall. I'll just hit that with my shoulder. So I stop myself. I'm like, great. And then I fell off the stage down, down the stairs, right legs up in the air. Somehow I cut my hand and we had to continue on the song. And in the song, we're changing our clothes and everybody's got little red spots. All my, buddy, all my buddies and my other uh, actor goes, you idiot. And then I got in real trouble at the intermission. The stage manager came storming up to me and I went, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I got a real well-deserved uh, falling out. And, the, and then the director probably said, keep it. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't allowed to keep it. No. Uh, yeah, falling, falling off the stage. Oh, and in that same show, we throw our helmets up. This is another night. We throw our helmets up and catch them. And this is a dinner theater. There's a table right there. And so I throw my helmet up and I bobble it. And then like a bowling uh, ball, it goes across their table spilling drinks. And yeah. <laughs> and thus ended your career at Stage West. Is that... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked at theater myself. I know how close those tables are. You feel sometimes like you're dancing on top of them. Sparky, yeah. what's the, of, of all the, of all the roles that you've done? Cause um, what's the one, what's the favorite? What's the one that, that is it Norman Bray or are there other, are there other roles? Are there roles that you, that you wish to play that you haven't played? Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a starting point. I'm still waiting to give my Hamlet. Yeah, well, you've been waiting a long time. I'm in the Polonius <laughs> years, my friend, I'm sorry. No, you are ageless and timeless, Sparky. Ageless and timeless, Thank yes. You. Uh, no, favorite roles, absolutely. Norman Gray uh, is, is, is one that I loved performing. Um, there was a show I did uh, by Dave Carley 
called Test Drive. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. It's a story of a man going from 25 to dead uh, as an old man. And he, there's just chapters from his life and he's not an, not an extra, the whole point of the story, I think, is that every life is extraordinary and you just see him become a father and a, a husband and a father and a salesman and a widower. And there's a very special moment in that show where I do direct address to the audience after my wife, my wife's funeral. And I, I talk about uh, how angry I've been and then how all of her friends and the community, I come out of my house and they're all there. And it's really touching. And I see as I'm direct talking to the audience, this middle-aged man in a golf shirt, big belly, ex-corporate, retired corporate guy, I think. He reaches up and he takes off his glasses and he does that. And I love the laughs. You know I'm a, <laughs> I, I adore being uh, the, the center of attention and, and laughs. But touching that man's heart, that, that really is a, is a special feeling. Yeah, those are great moments when you have those, when you know that you've absolutely connected with somebody like that. Um, yeah, it's a delightful show. We did it. Um, it's the, that's the one, it's the, it's, he's an AMC dealer, right? It's, it's exactly. the old yeah. American Motors. Yeah, yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely, lovely play. What's bringing you joy these days, my friend, in these, in these awkward, them, them COVID days? What's, what's bringing you joy in your life these days? Um, the fact that everyone in my circle is healthy and well, I celebrate that. I just talked to my 85-year-old mother in Edmonton, and she's fine. In fact, she's going out to the lake with my brother and his family, and she's been in her apartment all bubbled up almost by herself for however many weeks this has been. Uh, and she's going with the family. They're opening up all the bubbles with the kids, and she's, she's going to be safe at the lake outdoors getting air. And uh, so that brings me joy. And my family and my friends, I so look forward to the time when we can hug again. It's, I know. Uh, just the thought of that brings me joy. But uh, I'm also very, very lucky. I have a house with a beautiful yard that my wife has, uh, is an avid gardener. And, and uh, my dog walks every morning and afternoon in the lovely parks that are here in Toronto. Uh, there's a lot of joy to access. Well, Sparky, I don't know if you saw it, but I just I sent you a text just before we started this conversation oh. about about what's new in my life these days. Uh, we're building a deck, and because uh, I know that you're a super handy guy when it comes to all those kind of renovations and all that kind of stuff. So I shared that picture with you. My garden is exploding. Probably in the middle of the night, you'll receive a. A, a bushel basket full of zucchini or something. I'm going to become one of those neighbors. I'm going to become one of those one of those guys that leaves bushels of zucchinis on everyone's doorstep. So, um, my friend moved out of the city into a town called Fergus, and he says in the summertime you have to keep your car doors locked because if if you don't, when they come back, it'll be full of zucchini. <laughs> we we know Fergus all too well here. It's just down the road. That's why and we lock our cars for that very purpose because we know people from Fergus will come over here and put zucchinis in our cars. So even in, here in Orangeville, we lock our cars as well, so that uh, so that doesn't happen. Um, Steve Sparky, what's I've been at, here's a question. I've been asking this question. Uh, I don't know how this conversation came up, but we were talking about it with Debbie and. Do you have uh, a recurring actor's nightmare that always sort of strikes you? Just about every actor I know. I have one. Uh, Debbie shared hers. Do you have a, 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 a that you feel like sharing? Because I'm always curious as to why those things, that why we do that. What's well, your... Yours and mine match exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. it's, it's, uh, often I, I, don't ha I can't find my clothes. Uh, I'm naked. I'm trying to get on the stage 
and I realized I forgot to learn my lines and I forgot to rehearse and, but I've got to go out and, <clears throat> and people are pushing me and, and uh, yeah, yes, I don't know what is I'm it, doing. Is it always? Out. And it's my fault. Oh, of course. And, but is it, cause you know, it's, it's, it's our anxiety, right? It's our, it's our, it's our fear. It's our desire to do well. Is it always the same show for you? Like, are you always in the same situation? Or does that change? Well, I think it changes. Yeah. I think it changes. It, it, it's seldom about the show I'm in or rehearsing or learning. It's just some show, but it's a big, important show. They're all important, but, and it's always in a big theater. <laughs> and I, I'm just lost, pantsless and um, unprepared. Yeah, it's never going to be like a small theater in a, in a really terrible play where there's four people in the audience. It's always like 2,000 people sitting there watching your every move. It's always, yeah. it's, it's such an interesting, there must be a study on it somewhere. I have to do some more research or something because it just, it fascinates me about how we as, as actors, of course, it's fine, you know, as a director, I, you know, I don't have those quite the same, you have different nightmares or different, but not quite that one, but <laughs> It's, um, yeah, for me, it's always the same show. Always the same show. And it's always performance. It's never a director's nightmare. No, it's always performance. It's always, I'm going on stage. It's the exact same as you. I, I, I haven't bothered to learn the play, or we did it so long ago. I went, oh, yeah, I know that play. I can do that. Yeah, no problem. And uh, get out there. The or it's, it's always Les Mis. The orchestra starts. Oh. And I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue, and I don't have any pants. <laughs> Why do we do this to ourselves? What do, do, do investment bankers have investment banker dreams? Where the, the, Maybe, the, well, we, we have a lot, there's a lot of investment bankers who have been watching these videos and things like that. So I'm sure that we'll, we'll hear specifically from investment bankers. I don't know. Maybe lawyers do too. I don't know. So we invite anybody out there who has those kind of dreams to share them, those nightmares to share them with us. So what's happening next, my friend? Let's, I know that we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all, as you say, we can't wait to hug. We can't wait to come together and create. Um, thank you for sharing that wonderful workshop that we did last month, like a month ago or so, whatever that was, for, uh, for, uh, for young John, young John Daniel, with that really cool little play that he's been working on. So I know you're doing a lot of stuff. Are you, are you, keeping, are you able to keep your, those chops up? Because you know you're going to be back here soon, as soon as we can get you back. Audiences are demanding that you come back. I don't have a choice. So, do you? Are, are, what do you? Is there something going keeping your keeping your chops up? Uh, uh, right now, I've got uh, my wife and I have written a couple of plays, uh, which have gotten a little traction, and we have a. Uh, they were supposed to be done uh, this summer. Uh, one in uh, uh, Ontario at Drayton, and our premiere of our second play was happening in Persephone in September. But of course, <clears throat> they've been COVIDized and uh, put off for a year or, or whatever. But we have another play that we've talked about writing. Uh, this is writing. Uh, and I haven't, uh, we haven't uh, settled down and, and started working at it. I think we're just waiting for a little normalcy, if that's ever gonna come back. Yeah. To, uh, to, I mean, I'm excited to tell that story. And uh, I'm a little, a little confused about why both of us, and she's super disciplined and driven, uh, but both of us have just said, yeah, we'll, we'll just coast along <laughs> for a while. Well, as always, Sparky, you're two steps ahead of me. I was, that was, I was coming to the playwriting component of your career next. And you're being far too modest. Your plays are very, they're excellent and they've been produced all across the country and will continue to do so. Um, and we're, we'll be doing one of them here at Theatre Orangeville as soon as we can. It's interesting that comment though you say, I've, I've spoken to a number of writers um, that you know we sort of work with on a regular basis and that audiences have seen their plays four or five year. And you're, you're part of that group is that nobody really feels um, motivated, or not, not motivated, perhaps it's inspired to, to kind of take the time, or not the time, because heaven knows we all have time, but to kind of, you know, put pen to paper or however you 
magical creatures who write these wonderful plays do that because I don't really understand it, um, that how that alchemy works. Um, but uh, it, you're not alone in that. It, it's a real, it's an interesting thing. And I think you're, I think it's your comment about returning to normalcy, I think is a really important one. I think we all need to, when we feel that, when we feel that sense again, but I hope that you're, I hope that you will, that you will get pen to paper soon because everything you write is terrific. So. You're very kind. That's really great to hear that, 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 that it's out there, that it's, it's not just me being lazy or, or something. I, oh, no. I think it seems, I think it seems like a little um, uh, facile or in, indulgent to create my stories when there's such big stuff going on in the world. Um, for sure. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I guess we're all just, re I guess we're all just struggling for that normalcy and how that, what that's going to look like and, and what that, what that is. But the, the thing is always, you know, because we're doing a lot of online classes and we're talking about some online programming and things like that. But, you know, as you say, what we do the live experience will never ever be replicated. You know, it will never be. Um, this is a terrific way for us to see your smiling face, know that you're well, know that you're happy, know that we're going to see you again really soon. Um, but it's not being able to, you know, yeah. reach out and give you that big hug that you do every time you walk on stage, the way actors just embrace an audience and audiences embrace an actor and uh and take us on that journey yeah i think what i think what uh, uh, what just occurred to me is i think right now because everything is so fluid and we don't know what's next is i i feel like i'm living moment to moment which is a great way to live but there's no long view of 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 we'll do this play we'll tell this story and and make it go and then send it out to the world. I think what, what we're doing in my house, and I suspect all around the, the world, is getting through the day, making some, that's where I'm being creative, I'm making some nice dinners every day. Uh, my wife has been very happy because I'm putting my creativity into pots in the kitchen. And my smoker, uh, I got a smoker out back and I, Make oh, wow. And I uh, make uh, ribs, smoked ribs, all day on the smoker. Good stuff. Well, we'll be putting your address. We'll be putting your street address up <laughs> on this so that anybody who wants to stop by, you know, for us, uh, for at Sparky's uh, Smoke Shack or whatever you're calling it. Just call um, the apple, applewood smell. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, my friend, as always. It's wonderful to see your smiling face and to, uh, and to see you and to touch base. I'm glad that you're doing well. And uh, stay safe, stay happy, and we will see you, God willing, as soon as we can. I can't wait. I love it there. Please give my best to everybody in the office and everybody uh, around. And shout out to the Lord Duff friends and... Uh, I missed my time in Orangeville. I can't wait to get back. We'll get you up there, my friend. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks Sparky. Thank you for joining Theatre Orangeville for Backstage Pass with David Nairn. Until next time.